Hello, my name is Kara Capitina Young, and I'm an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the University of Colorado. As you can see by the title, we're going to be discussing everyone's favorite topic, uh, pharmacology. Specifically, we're going to review the pharmacology of glaucoma medications, both the topical and systemic options. So this is the outline uh, of how the lecture will go. We're going to start with reviewing some basic pharmacology and how that relates to the eye. Then I'll go over some of the preservatives that are used in glaucoma drops, um, some topical anesthetics, which we use often in glaucoma clinic. And then we'll go over all of the classes of topical glaucoma medications or IOP lowering medicines. And then lastly, we'll end with the oral and IV options for IOP lowering. There are several ways of delivering medications to the eye. You can use systemic medications delivered either intravenously or orally, uh, but it's important to remember that different medications have different levels of ocular penetration, and that's why some systemic medications work better than others for ocular issues. On a local scale, you can of course deliver medications through drops and ointments, but you can also do it via injections, both into and around the eye. A unique fact about the eye is that our tear volume or the volume of our fornix or cul-de-sac where eye drops are delivered into is relatively small. It's about seven to 10 microliters. But a single drop from a dropper bottle delivers about 50 microliters of volume in one drop. So by nature, a single drop from a dropper bottle is inherently wasteful. I like to review this fact with my patients who run out of their drops early because often they're delivering more than one drop um, or they're worried they didn't get enough in if most of the drop gets in the eye but one drop but some of it I'm sorry rolls onto their cheek and so I tell them that just delivering that one drop is enough. Another unique thing that's specific to the eye is that eye drops need to be biphasic to be able to penetrate the cornea. And that's because our cornea is composed of several layers, each with a different affinity for lipid and water, as you can see listed here. Moving on to side effects. Now we know that all medications have side effects and local side effects are easy to understand. You deliver an eye drop onto the ocular surface, of course it can have ocular side effects. But eye drops can also have systemic side effects. And that's because drops drain from the ocular surface into the punctum and travel into the nasal lacrimal system. Now, if you've ever used an eye drop before and tasted it in the back of your throat shortly after you put it on your eye, that's the route it took to get there. Once it enters the nasal lacrimal system, it's absorbed by the venous plexus, which then leads to systemic distribution. Now, to be fair, it's only a small amount of the medicine that is absorbed and distributed systemically from a single eye drop. So overall, systemic side effects of topical medications are rare, but they can certainly happen. And anyone practicing glaucoma regularly or who sees patients on a lot of eye drops, I'm sure has a patient that they can recall who had a systemic side effect from a topical eye drop. There are a few ways to lessen the amount of systemic absorption. The first is to always instruct patients not to use more drops than instructed. As we mentioned in the previous slide, one drop is enough. Patients can also close their eyes after installation for a few minutes or perform punctal occlusion, which is described here on the slide. There are also some useful videos online of how to perform punctal occlusion that you can refer your patients to as well if you think that that would be a useful activity for them to start doing. So now let's talk about preservatives. What are they and why are they there? And no, it's not to make your life more difficult, though it often feels that way, especially if you live or work in a dry climate like we do here in Colorado. So preservatives are chemicals that are required by the FDA to help prevent infectious contamination of multi-dose bottles. In other words, they kill the bacteria, viruses, and fungi and keep the medications sterile after opening. The most common preservative used in ocular medications is BAK, or benzalkonium chloride, which we'll discuss more on the next slide. But there are a few other preservatives that you should be aware of as well. Polyquad, or polyquaternium-1, is an alternate preservative used primarily outside of the U.S. Saucia is another alternative preservative, which is used in Travitan-Z. 
It causes oxidative damage to bacterial cells only, sparing human cells, and is thus less toxic to the ocular surface. Purate is another preservative, which is found in alpha-gan P, and similar to Sofsia, it targets microbial cellular components that are not present in human tissues, thereby not affecting the human cells. So once again, it's less toxic to the ocular surface than VAK. As mentioned before, BAK is benzalkonium chloride, and it's the most commonly used preservative in ocular medications in the United States. It works by acting as a detergent, splicing cell membranes and disrupting epithelium. But it does this non-selectively, meaning it does this to both microbial cells and human tissue. And because of this, it can cause ocular surface issues such as tearful and instability, a decrease in the number of goblet cells, and disruption of the corneal epithelium, all of which leads to a high rate of irritation, intolerance, and allergy to drops with BAK in them. What's even tougher, though, is trying to determine whether your patient has an allergy or an intolerance to the medication itself or to the BAK component, because this BAK intolerance often shows up in a delayed or nonspecific manner, presenting just as ocular surface issues. One other thing that I do want to review is what preservative-free drops mean. The best and most accurate definition is of a preservative-free drop is one that has no preservatives in them, and therefore they're packaged as single-use doses. But sometimes preservative-free is used to describe drops that have alternate preservatives in them. While this is sometimes inaccurate, it may be something that you hear from patients or colleagues. Um, so people may refer to alpha-gam P, for instance, as preservative-free. When it's not actually free of preservatives, it has a non-BAK preservative. Now let's talk about topical anesthetics. For reference, traditionally, these all have white colored tops. The most commonly used topical anesthetics in the U.S. are preparacaine and tetracaine, and both work uh, by affecting the flow of sodium ions, which leads to anesthesia of the ocular surface. By anesthetizing the ocular surface, it allows for things like pressure checks and performing gonioscopy in clinic, and it can also be useful for, useful for minor procedures such as corneal suture removals, minor procedures, and uh, corneal foreign body removals. It can also be used as a great diagnostic tool for ocular surface disorders since they temporarily relieve pain associated with things like dry eyes, corneal abrasions, and corneal ulcers. Cocaine is another topical anesthetic that was first used in 1884 and provides excellent topical anesthesia. But it is pretty toxic to the corneal epithelium, so you should use it very carefully. Also, as you can imagine, it is strictly regulated and can be very difficult to obtain. While preparacaine and tetracaine are often used interchangeably in clinical practice, uh, there are a few differences to be aware of. So preparacaine's preservative is BAK, and therefore patients who are intolerant to or allergic to BAK may have difficulty with preparacaine. Tetracaine, however, has a different preservative called chlorobutanol. Uh, so some patients who can't tolerate preparacaine can tolerate tetracaine because of this. They do have similar side effects. They can both cause allergic reactions, contact dermatitis, redness, irritation, and burning. Um, but again, some patients who are allergic to preparacaine are able to tolerate tetracaine, and some patients who can't tolerate tetracaine are able to tolerate preparacaine. Another very important uh, consideration when we're discussing topical anesthetics are is anesthetic abuse. And this is where chronic use of topical anesthetics such as tetracaine or preparacaine um, cause permanent damage to the cornea. These often present as a ring ulcer, pictures of which are on the next slide, um, and it can be incredibly difficult to treat. And for this reason, we never, ever provide topical anesthetics to patients for long-term use, and we don't recommend it even if it's diluted.
Next, we're gonna talk about topical glaucoma medications. And this is where the top color of the bottles can be very, very helpful. Um, since patients often don't know, can't remember, or can't pronounce the name of their medication. Um, and actually, some studies have shown that bottle cap color is the most commonly used method by which patients remember or differentiate all of their eye drops and ophthalmic medications. But keeping that in mind, it is important to note that some patients describe the same color differently. Um, this is especially common with the prostaglandin analogs, which have teal or turquoise tops that can sometimes be called blue or green or teal or turquoise. Um, and so sometimes it is really important to truly differentiate what color that top is. Um, and it may be helpful to have your patients bring the drops in sometime and ask them what they call that color. Now, all glaucoma medications work in one of two ways. They either decrease the inflow um, or decrease production of aqueous, or they increase the outflow um, or open the drain, increase the drainage of aqueous fluid. Um, the ones that increase the outflow can work in one of two areas, usually either on the conventional outflow, outflow pathway um, through the trabecular meshwork. And those drops that work that way are meiotics like pilocarpine, the rho kinase inhibitors, um, and nitric oxide analogs. And then those that work on the uveoscleral outflow or the non-conventional pathway, which are prostaglandin analogs, nitric oxide analogs, and alpha agonists. Those that decrease aqueous production or decrease the inflow, I remember these by ABC. Um, and so that's the alpha agonists, the beta blockers, um, and the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, which have a purple top for the alpha agonists, a yellow or light blue top for beta blockers, and an orange top for those carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And we'll go through each of these classes of medication uh, in the next slides. The first class of medications uh, that we will discuss are the meiotics. Uh, these all increase aqueous outflow through the trabecular meshwork. Now there are two classes of these agents. There's the indirect acting agent, such as echothiophate, uh, which is rarely used in clinical practice anymore, but it is infamous on standardized tests because of its association with causing iris cysts. And then there are the direct acting agonists like pilocarpine, acetylcholine, and carbacol or myostat, um, which is still commonly used intraocularly during surgery. Now, pilocarpine is the most common of these to be used outpatient in clinic. It has a nice bright green top, um, so it's usually pretty easy for patients to tell apart. And it also tends to come in a bigger bottle, which patients will also um, sometimes describe when they're trying to describe which drop they're using. One of the drawbacks of pilocarpine though is dosing is four times per day, which is pretty tough for a lot of patients to do. The other big drawback of pilocarpine and most meiotics um, is the side effect profile, all of which also contribute to making this not a preferred drop for a lot of patients and somewhat difficult to use. Those side effects include meiosis um, or a small pupil, which causes poor vision at nighttime for patients and can cause tunnel vision. It can cause pseudo accommodation and ciliary body contraction, which leads to refractive error changes, um, induced myopia or nearsightedness. It tends to cause a headache or a brow ache over the eye that uh, you're using the drop in or bilateral if you're using it bilaterally. Um, and because of that forward shifting and contraction of the ciliary body, it can increase the risk of retinal detachments. And then lastly, um, it can break down the blood aqueous barrier and increase the risk of intraocular inflammation. Um, so none of these are great side effects. Um, and a lot of patients can tolerate it, but a lot of patients can't, uh, all of which limit its use in clinical practice nowadays.